So can you guys hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Oh, good. Um, as promised, I want to show you guys, I want to play your presentations here. Um, I have two of them ready to go. A third one that we just discovered is not quite finished yet. But uh, what I'd like to do is to play your presentation. And after it's done, have a question and answer session from everyone in the class. And those questions can involve how did you send it? How did you get the voiceover? You know, technical questions, as well as questions about the subject matter. And so you guys ready to see uh, Charlotte and Megan's? And I saw you hope the link works, and I'm pretty sure it does because aired it because I tested it. It's loading, it's loading. For our project, we did Lakawan and his son. No, Megan, it's actually pronounced Laokawan. Oh, my bad. Laokawan and his son. Is that better? Much better. Here, here, here the screen. Megan and I chose this sculpture for our final presentation for several reasons. We both wanted to do a piece from ancient Greece or Rome because we like that style the most out of all the chapters. And we also have- We can't see the screen. Oh, okay, hold on. I have taken AP history in high school. And I have taken uh, humanities, which helped us a lot with this project. To narrow down our options, we listed specific Thank pieces you. that we had background knowledge about from this class in our previous classes. We narrowed down our choices to Laocoon and his sons and the statue of Romulus and Remus. I had more knowledge about Romulus and Remus. And I had more knowledge about Laocoon and his sons. We chose Laocoon and his sons because Megan had written an essay recently on the piece, which had a lot of information we needed for this presentation. In conclusion, we chose Laocoon and his sons because we both liked Greek sculpture and had information and sources already found for us, which made the process really simple. Okay, so here's a little background on this piece. Laocoon and his sons is pronounced Laocoon and his sons. Pliny the Elder attributed this work to Athanodorus, Hadrosandros, and Polydoros of Rhodes. The creation date of this piece is heavily debated, but has been narrowed down to sometime between 40 and 30 BCE in Rome, Italy. This white marble statue stands tall at seven feet and 10 and a half inches high. It is part of the Hellenistic art period and is currently in the Vatican in Rome. Although there are two stories behind this with different beginnings, they have the same upsetting ending with the death of Lacawan and his son. I will only be talking about the better known story, which is why I really like this piece. The story starts during the Trojan War. Laocoon, Laocoon was a priest of Apollo in the city of Troy and warned his fellow warriors against taking the wooden horse left by the Greeks as a gift. The story goes that Athena and Poseidon favored the Greeks and were angered by Laocoon trying to warn the soldiers, so they sent two great sea serpents named Porces and Chariboa to kill Laocoon and his son. Laocoon. In the Romans' point of view, the death of these innocents was crucial to the decision of Aeneas, who heeded Lacawan's warning to flee yeah. Troy and eventually led to the founding of Rome. The photos on this slide relate to the story. On the bottom right, we have Athena, and above her is Zeus. Athena is the goddess of war and the daughter of Zeus, so it's only fitting that she's involved in the story. This particular statue was made in 1982 by Alan McGuire, 
It is a full-scale statue and is in the replica of the Parthenon in Nashville, Tennessee. The statue of Zeus is the original piece as it was recovered from the ancient shipwreck. It's almost in perfect condition because of the lack of air. There were also lots of sea creatures, including barnacles, which helped to preserve it. It's bronze and was made in the early classical period in 460 BCE. Next to Athena, we have an illustrated drawing of what the wooden horse most likely would have looked like as the Trojans hauled it inside their walls, ignoring Laocoon's warning. Power and belief system. This piece was created during the late Hellenistic period, aka the Greco-Roman period, which took place between 146 and 30 BCE, and the piece was created sometime between 40 and 30 BCE. The governing system of Greece at this time was a democracy, which derived from the Greek word demos, meaning people. Since 460 BCE, Athens had been associated with the birth of democracy. The meaning of the system was that any 18 years or older male citizen could speak and vote in the assembly of Athens. Mathematics was very important to the Greeks, and here are some of their most famous mathematicians that changed math for the better. Diophantus founded arithmetic. Eratosthenes invented long longitude and latitude. Euclid is the father of geometry. Hipparchus founded trigonometry and the equinoxes. Pythagoras created the Pythagorean theorem. And Thales founded the Thales theorem. Balance. The sun on the left and lap lawn stand on a pair of stairs. Whether that be for support for marble or for artistic purposes, it definitely stands out. The serpent is also more on the left side, strangling the sun on the left and lap lawn, while the sun on the right is not as wrapped around as a snake. The two sons, who are twins named Antiphas and Thambreas, are on either side of lap lawn, evening out the piece visually. Emphasis. It stands out in its size and position compared to other statues of that time. The great diagonal lines of the struggling bodies and the serpent's hold lead the viewer's eyes all around the statue. Strong intensity from the struggle with the great serpent, Lacalon's expression is most noticeable as his face is towards the front. The pure fear and agony can be felt from this struggle for life. Movement. The movement in this piece is almost overwhelming. The three focal points, Lacalon and his son, struggle against the hold of the serpent, struggle under its power. Line. The lines of the contorting and contracting bodies of both the people in the statue and the serpent show the high level of skill of the artist in this Hellenistic time period. Shape and form. The shape of the piece immediately draws the viewer in as Lacalon is front and center. Space. The space between the figures or the lack thereof is quite noticeable. Lacalon is reading more to the left, giving a gap of space between him and the sun on the right. Color and texture. Since it was never painted, it is easy to tell that the material of this statue is marble. The material, of course, also plays into the texture. The statue looks and feels polished. Influence and legacy. This piece was so large that Michelangelo himself was impressed by the huge scale of the work. The emotionalism in Laocoon and his sons was highly influential on later Baroque sculpture and neoclassical sculpture, which were both art periods that came after this piece. Baroque sculptures are known to be grandeur, dramatic, dynamic, and emotional, and neoclassical sculpture is defined by symmetry, monumental scale, and its serious subject matter. The statue has retained a continuing fascination for succeeding generations of sculptures. The pictures on this slide are of a few sculptures other than Laocoon and his sons. The one at the very top is of the David by Michelangelo, who had commented and admired the sculpture of Laocoon and his sons. The picture in the center is called Blessed Ludovica Albertoni by Gian Lorenzo Bernini. I included this picture to give an example of Baroque sculpture, which is defined by drama. And finally, the picture on the very bottom is of the Statue of Liberty in New York, designed by Frederic Auguste Bartholdi. I included this piece to give an example of neoclassical sculpture, which is defined by monumental scale. These are our sources. Thanks for watching. And this done because we both like Greek, Greek sculpture and had information and sources already found. The story starts during the Trojan War. Laocoon was a priest. No, Megan, of you're supposed to say Laocoon. You're supposed to mess it up. Oh my God. <laughs> in the replica of the Parthenon in national, national.
Nashville. National? Where did the hell did national come from? <gasps> Dynamic and emotional and neoclassic. <laughs> no! <laughs> neoclassic. The emotionalism and lack of honor is that it was. You mispronounced it. It's like I'm going Charlotte. <laughs> Very, very good. Thank you. Thank you both. Um, let me see. Do we have questions? Did you, uh, so like in your presentation, did you have like uh, favorite of uh, one of the gods you mentioned you really think um, uh, inspired us the most or like what we use like Pythagoras like in the in mathematics or Um, I had one question on um, something. I was wondering if, were you guys together when you recorded this or were you guys apart? Because we still haven't recorded ours, like our presentation. And I was wondering how to like do that. We were going to do it on Zoom, but. Um, not, yeah. We did it um, together. We just found a spot in the library or the one of the meeting rooms in the design building. Um, I think the best way for you guys to do it would probably be over Zoom like you guys were thinking. I have a suggestion. Me and Peter, uh, he just sent me all of his recordings, like he recorded each slide by slide, like one at a time. And then I did mine and I just put all the videos like together in an app and I just put all the things together. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. There's a lot of ways to do this. Hey, guys are, this is good. And there's also a lot of ways to send this. And uh, Charlotte and Megan sent this as a, a YouTube link. Um, and so, uh, Alex, uh, you sent it via email? Is that yes, right? Yes, yeah, I did. I, I sent you the... I was making sure because I thought Adam uh, sent a video link, I believe, last week. But I shared with you to today before class my th my presentation uh, through PowerPoint. Yeah, okay. I had sent a PDF of the PowerPoint and then the MP4 file for my recording. Okay. All right. So he has the, the MP4 recording. So. Yeah, and I think that part of it is is that it. I think they'll go through the inbox. I think you can attach that, especially since we're talking about files that are only, you know, seven, eight minutes in length, you mm -hmm. know. So anyway, they got through. Um, and, and let's see. Uh, I got this one too from uh, um, Let's see, who is this from? Oh, Brady and, and Grace. And they sent that through, they put it on Google Docs, I believe. Is that what you had? It's yeah. Google Slides, but Google we Slides. didn't have we didn't have our audio done, so we still have Yeah, this is one that's yeah, I understand. Uh yeah, and you guys are gonna finish this up and, and and you can put it back in the same place, let me know. But see, my, and that's quite all right. And this is pretty much what I thought might happen would that some of, was that some of you would uh, be done and be able to show these as examples and that the rest of you guys would choose to finish it up and, send it to me and we'll look at those on Wednesday. And so let's take a look at what Alex and Adam did. This is a, 
for our presentation, we chose Stonehenge. And okay. I'm Adam Ferry. And I'm Alex Hurd. Uh, the reason why I chose Can Stonehenge you guys was see this? because of the amount of mystery surrounding it. And even though we talked about it, yeah. Yes, we can. Okay, good. Now, so I was interested in finding out more about it. And although there are many theories that it's not known where the refinement made to Stonehenge, and due to its existence, sign of how really society was formed, and you can see the many different artifacts that are found at the site and were buried up for its construction. And I really believe that Stonehenge is truly one of the great mysteries in the world. So Stonehenge's background, it was the most sophisticated stone circle during the prehistoric times in the world. It is, its construction began around 31 BC, 3100 BC and was completed over a thousand years later. The monument is located 88 miles southwest of London in the town called Salisbury. And it is classified under, for being the largest Cremation cemetery is known in Neolithic Britain. Today, it is all is used by it was used by pagan religious, which have some similarities with Druids, as they often use Stonehenge for formal ceremonies, normally long before the tur any form tourists arrived. It is characterized under Neolithic design, as the majority of Stonehenge's rocks were brought over and were and formed after 1800 BCE. So as to who built this monument, the identities of the original builders of Stonehenge are relatively unknown by historians. In the 17th century, John Aubrey linked the Druids as the builders of Stonehenge, using it as a place for sacrificial ceremony. However, radiocarbon dating later disproved this, showing it was constructed over a thousand years before. If Druids used Stonehenge for their ceremonies, they got the site secondhand. Despite this, modern Druids have laid claim to Stonehenge. It's more likely that several groups of native Britons constructed the monument in different stages. Bones, tools, and other artifacts that were discovered at the site seem to support that. So one of the, th the theories behind Stonehenge is that many people believe that this monument was built by the Romans or the Phoenicians. However, there aren't any clues to prove that these were actually true behind this creating the stones. For, first, the Ro way back when the Romans established their territory across Europe and saw Stonehenge as an element for art, which was important enough for them. And later it became a symbol of unification of Great Britain. Today, it is seen as a popular tourist site as for people to look at these massive ancient rocks formed in a, in, a, in a circle to tell which theories they really want to believe behind the historians, what, what they were told, telling them. Another theory was it was a, a piper illusion where there would be points where two pipers were playing music, the sound waves would, have can, would have cancel each other out, creating spots, causing the sound to lessen. Stonehenge is claimed to be built at the direction of Merlin, who is the leader of the Druids and was responsible for bringing the stones. The Druids were priests of the free Catholic tribes, and in which that theory has stood for almost over 300 years, according to many historians. So Stonehenge's construction was quite a lengthy process. Stonehenge began as a timber structure around 3100 BCE with the ring of 56 wooden posts. Around 100 years later, a wooden structure was built inside the enclosure and functioned as a cremation cemetery. It was one of the earliest and largest discovered in Britain. In 2250 BCE, Stonehenge began to resemble the stone structure we know today. At first, 80 pillars of dolerite, rhyolite, and tuff, each weighing around four tons each, formed two concentric circles with an entrance towards the northeast. These blue stones came from southwestern Wales, and scholars debate how the villagers transported them to the site. One theory is that they made makeshift sleds out of logs to carry the stones on. An altar stone made of greenish sandstone slab was transported there from somewhere near Abergavenny in southeast Wales. 
It was during this time that the northeastern entrance was altered to line up with the midsummer sunrise and the midwinter sunset. A parallel pair of ditches and banks running from the monument's entrance to the Avon River, 1.5 miles away, is known as the Avenue. This was most likely used as a ceremonial path. The monument then went through a period of remodeling between 2280 and 1900 BCE. 30 sarsen blocks were cut and transported from a nearby quarry, each around 13 and a half feet tall, 7 feet wide, and weighing 25 tons. They were set up in a 98-foot diameter circle. Then smaller sarsen blocks were placed horizontally to form post and lintel structures or trilithons. Five more of these trilithons were placed inside the circle in a horseshoe shape. The blue stones were arranged multiple times, eventually forming a horseshoe and inner circle between the sarsen circle and the trilithons, mirroring them. And it's the ruins of this design that we see today. So what was really Stonehenge's main purpose? According to many historians, this monument was seen as a solar calendar, and it was to mark the movement of the sun along with the two solstice, the winter and the summer. The presence of human remains suggests that Stonehenge could have served as an animal burial ground, as well as a ceremonial complex for the temple of the people who were deceased. Most people and historians saw it as a place for healing for those who were sick. As we can see, Stonehenge is now visited by many people across Britain because of its massive size, stones, and the ancient stories that are told behind it. Parker, according to Parker Pearson, he suggests that the Welsh blue stones were the first to be put in place at Stonehenge, and it was, and that was the monument that they came from that was really important. Stones would have considered to be ancestral symbols for Western Britons, and at that time, it was served as a center for of religious worship for the pagans. So when looking at some of the monuments related to Stonehenge in the surrounding area, they really help us to better understand the Neolithic and Bronze Age ceremonial and mortuary practices. The area hosts more than 350 burial mounds and major prehistoric monuments such as the Avenue, the Cursus, Woodhenge, and the Durrington Mall of which are shown here. And Stonehenge provided a variety of uses to the cultures who inhabited the area over the centuries, its function changing as it was built and rebuilt. And here below are our works cited sources for more information where we where we got it from. Thank you. Very good guys. Questions? No questions? Well, I just have a couple of comments, and that is that I liked both of these. These were very well done. And so you guys gave me some good examples for the others as they put their um, presentations together. And so I had no idea how long this would take, but I think our time is probably best used to let you guys, while I have you on the phone here, while you are at least partially in, in, in touch with each other to give you guys um, the rest of the time to button it up. Um, I have the deadline for this as tonight. I'll move it up a little bit uh, until tomorrow night at midnight. And as they come in, I'll set it up just like this. So we'll be able to, um, we'll be able to take care of it. And Dorian, I just got your message. Uh, it's gonna, it would take me a little bit to 
uh, actually um, connect this onto my computer. So we'll start with yours. If you're finished, we'll start with yours on Wednesday. Is that good? Yeah, that sounds good. Sounds great. Well, I enjoyed this, you guys, and uh, Charlotte and Megan, you gave us the extra footage on there, too. That was kind of cool. Um, the director's cut, the bloopers. So anyway, you got any questions for me before I call it a day? All right. Well, I'll see you guys on Wednesday with some more good PowerPoint presentations. So, adios. Thank you. You bet. Bye. See you Wednesday. See you Wednesday.